Well, as we wait for Tiago to run and get our tech support people back, um, I'll just give you guys a quick introduction. So I'm Erin Brady. I'm one of the uh, co-chairs of the Google Doctoral Consortium for W4A, along with Volker, Volker Sorge. Um, <laughs> so we had our doctoral consortium on Sunday the 10th. Uh, we had, oh, great, thank you. Um, so this is a picture of our doctoral consortium. We had six panelists with us, or six uh, students with us and four panelists for a half day session. Each of the students was able to give a 20 minute presentation about their ongoing PhD research and then get 20 minutes of feedback from experts in the field. Uh, so first of all, we'd like to thank our panel. Um, it was chaired by Raman from Google and then our panelists were Chris Bailey, uh, Hiro Takagi from IBM Tokyo and Yu Zhang from Google as well. Um, we also want to thank our review panel, Shadi, Chris, Janal, Simon, Abi, uh, Philip, and Elise, and the University of Quebec at Montreal for hosting us. And then also thank you to Google for their generous funding for student travel and accommodations. So with that, um, we're going to have three of our doctoral consortium presenters give lightning talks in this session. The other three will present in the afternoon. And so we'll get started with Michael from University of Waterloo. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Yes, I'm uh, Michael Cormier. My supervisors are Richard Mann and Robin Cohen, and we also work very closely with Karen Moffat of McGill University. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the use of computer vision-based analysis of web page structure for assistive interfaces. So pa we, can, we define page structure analysis as the process of determining the semantic structure of the contents of a page. Um, the typical approach to this uh, uses analysis of the DOM tree of the page for evidence about the semantic structure. Now this is convenient to access, but the implementation structure may not match the semantic structure and it is implementation dependent. Our proposed approach is to analyze an image of the rendered web page for evidence about semantic structure. Now this allows us to use the representation created by the page designer uh, to convey the semantic structure to users. So what can vision do that the DOM tree can't? Well, it gives us implementation independence. We can see inside infographics and flash objects, and we're not dependent on any particular coding conventions or techniques. What interfaces can a backend based on this system support? Well, we've been looking at decluttering, screen readers, and region magnification, although I'm sure there are many others. Now, we start with page segmentation, the process of recursively dividing a page into a hierarchical segmentation tree of semantically significant regions. And you can see in the, a lot of people can see an example there. Um, this is useful on its own, but it's also useful for further stages in page structure analysis, <coughs> such as uh, region classification. Here's an example of a page segmented with our algorithm. Uh, it picks out the three main columns, uh, and within the columns it picks out, for example, news article blurbs, and then segments the text of the blurb from the thumbnail or thumbnail placeholder. And here I show an example of a mock-up decluttering interface which can gray out non-focus regions and there's two different sizes displayed. This is just a mock-up of the interface, but it's based on a real segmentation produced by our algorithm. Region classification is the process of labeling regions in the segmentation tree according to their semantic role in the page. Uh, they, we use a graphical model with a structure based on the segmentation tree. Um, and we can do efficient inference on this because of the model structure. We've performed a series of experiments uh, in region classification using area labels to uh, create a ground truth data set. Uh, we attempt to predict the area labels. Um, now, we have encountered a few problems with this data. We have a lot of unlabeled regions, and the classes tend to be highly imbalanced, which is a huge challenge for any machine learning algorithm. Uh, our results.
results from tests on a 35-page data set with well over 4,000 regions in total uh, were promising, although they do show room for improvement. Uh, common classes were recognized much more accurately than rare ones, as one might expect. Um, there are two, one common error was misclassification of a labeled region as unlabeled or vice versa. And we suspect that this may be due to the fact that a region may be unlabeled either because no label applies to it or simply because the page developer didn't assign a label to it. Uh, this can cause noise in the ground truth data and that's always a problem for machine learning algorithms. Now we hope that region classification could be useful for screen readers because, uh, well, area labels are already used by screen readers, but they can't be applied to component parts of things like flash objects, and they're not always present at all. Uh, if we can infer them from the visual structure of the page, then we're not dependent on including them, and we're not dependent on the implementation of the page. So in conclusion, the proposed project is to develop computer vision techniques for the analysis of the semantic structure of web pages. We, we think that vision-based technology has significant advantages for this area, and also that uh, the analysis of man-made images such as web pages that are designed to hit human perceptual cues also has great potential for computer vision research. Uh, thank you. Scoot up just so I can speak into the microphone. Um, oh, yes, yeah, Simon, go ahead. Cool. So, um, could you tell me why you're using computer vision, but why do you not use the um, synthesis of the cascade and star sheets to go on um, the rendering itself so you can kind of pretend you're a browser? Right. Um, we, I think in a practical system, we would do exactly that. Um, for the current research project, uh, we're trying to push the limits of what can be done using purely the rendered page. Our system is Bayesian top to bottom, so it would be relatively easy to integrate evidence from the, uh, say, the DOM tree as well, um, which is an advantage over a lot of, uh, say, rule-based systems that, uh, uh, for example, BIPS has a lot of heuristics, and it's a well-known one that that's actually based on the DOM tree, but it's based, based on visual properties defined there. Um, so yes, uh, I think in a practical system we would do that, but for uh, experimental control and for, the, uh, for our hopes for this as a computer vision project as well, we're trying to push the pure vision as far as we can. Great, all right, well I'd like to present you with a certificate to commemorate your participation, right. and right, thank, thank you. you. Our next presenter will be Maria Rauschenberger. I hope I pronounced it okay. Uh, from the University of oh, yeah, yeah. Um, from Pampa Fabra. So, hi, I'm Maria Rauschenberger from the University of Pompeii Fabra in Barcelona. <laughs> uh, my supervisors are Ricardo Baez Yates and Luz Raelio. And today, I'm really happy to talk about my PhD topic, which I started in January of this year. And it's about detecting dyslexia by a web-based game with music elements. So first of all, I would like to give you some um, informa basic information about dyslexia. Dyslexia is a learning disability which comes with visual and hearing um, difficulties. And I have a small cartoon here which is, um, shows a, a child which is wishing something for Christmas. I know Christmas is far away, but it comes every year. So. Um, yeah, he's wishing for a beer, a bike, and a dog, and he's writing it down. And probably, if you can see, there are some mistakes in it. So it's a common mistake to change a letter for dyslexic people. So like a pike means like a bike, but he uses a P instead of a B. So, and as Santa receives this, um, this letter, I mean, even if it wouldn't have been printed, the spell checker probably wouldn't have gathered. So, and then he sees what the child is wishing for. And this happens a lot in regular life. So just imagine you're a person with dyslexia and you're writing letters and um, yeah, getting real errors, um, real world errors. So, 
and uh, how many are affected. 10% of the population have dyslexia, so um, this is quite a lot. And I'm normally talking about children, so, uh, but it's not true, so it sticks with you your whole life. You have it, um, you normally get um, diagnosed with bad grades. It doesn't have to be, but it's uh, common, uh, still common. So people have bad grades in school because of sp spelling mistakes, and they're just as um, average intelligent than everybody else. So this is really frustrating and um, just not sh for the child, also for parents. And um, everyone is really frustrated. So it does affect your whole life and you have to practice a lot to overcome it. And um, there has been already some, some work on it. So exercises where um, people uh, can learn how to spell, how to write and improve themselves. Also with music and um, how to overcome it. Also the detection have been um, investigated already. So how to detect a child which um, um, where a person to detect if they have dyslexia or not. And they mom normally relate it to, to words, to letters. And um, to just, the idea is, or the, the thing is, if you want to give people more time to practice and not go th through the frustration of school, like um, being detected because of bad grades, and start earlier to give them more time, how can we do this? Because how can we detect a child with dyslexia when they don't even know know any letters. I mean, you know, I mean, this, this is the main point. So um, how are we going to approach that if, if, yeah, if they don't know any letters, but we still want to give them more time? And um, as I said, there also come hearing difficulties with it. So um, the idea is to find the indicators for pre-readers with dyslexia and related to music to see if, if we can find indicators. And um, if we find them, as I'm pretty sure because I already looked into that. Um, we, we integrate that into, um, and detect it into a tool and detect and support people with dyslexia. So um, the approach is, what do you hear? And it's, um, the idea is that you use the indicators we found already, like short-term memory difficulties, phonological memory, and working memory, and transform it into a task. So like finding the same sound, distinguish between sounds, short time interval perception. And this can be tasked to, to get to children, like the age of three, and see if this is working. And I know what you're thinking. I mean, at the age of three, they're really small, and they probably, you know, if you give them a task, they don't want to do that. But there's a game called memory, you probably know it. And it's with um, pictures normally, and you try to find the same picture under it, and it's a game. So if we transform this into, um, for music elements, and say like, find the same sound instead of finding the same picture, then you have something to work with. And if we go along and use it on the digital basis, then we can um, get the metadata of it, go for machine learning and try to find the distinguished parameters between the groups. So this is the, the, the main goal, to, to see if the indicators are working out, finding them while playing a serious game. So the next steps will be defining the dependent measurements design a language experience study, and explore all the populations. To sum up, early and easy detection with music while playing a serious game. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Maria? into that but it's a really nice um, uh, um, idea to, to do actually yeah um, I think that also the common default methods they are not like really true uh, you mean they're not 100% so this is exactly the problem and we are using it as a ground truth so um, yeah this this could happen um, and, and we should look into that as well yeah
Our last presenter will be Neil Rogers. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Erin. Uh, uh, as, as she already said, my name is uh, Neil Rogers. I'm a second year PhD candidate at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. Uh, my research is funded by an EPSRC case award and an industrial partner called Microlink. So I'm here today to give uh, a very brief uh, talk about my uh, research into evaluating the mobile web accessibility of electronic text for print impaired people in higher education. So uh, what I want to do to you to just to, to start that is to introduce you to uh, what I'm currently referring to as, as five, five layers uh, in an accessibility evaluation framework. I just want to focus just very specifically on that. There are other areas of my research, but because of the time, time limits, I, I just want to focus on this. Um, uh, the, the first layer is uh, the, the, the discovery layer. And uh, as, as you can see, I'm sure you've all probably used the Google search, uh, search box. Um, and this relates directly to uh, perhaps an, an institute search, say like, for example, the ACM Digital Library. And so, uh, you know, in the public domain, perhaps it might be the, the Kindle ebook store, or perhaps it might be the, um, uh, you know, Google uh, um, Project Gutenberg, where they, they make available many thousands of, of ebooks. The second layer um, is what I'm referring to as the, the, the metadata layer. I just want you to take a moment to imagine the, the great library of Alexandria. So for example, uh, you know, scrolls, manuscripts, uh, floor to ceiling. Now on each of those scrolls was uh, 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 attached a piece of string or cord. And on each of those uh, pieces of string was a tag that had uh, information written on it. And that information, it might have included, for example, uh, the title of the manuscript. It might have also uh, included information about uh, the contents of the manuscript. Now, that was simply there to help people to find and locate the information quickly. And that's what we, we refer to as, as metadata. So essentially, it's data about data, or information about information. The the third layer I'm referring to is the e-content format layer. Now, I'm just using a, um, uh, essentially a web analogy here, uh, as you probably uh, already gathered. So uh, we've currently got web-based uh, uh, formats, such as HTML and CSS, which I'm sure you all know are used to create websites. Now, those relate directly to um, the uh, electronic formats that are used for, for digital reading, so for example, uh, uh, the, the EPUB format, PDF, or perhaps even Am Amazon's AZW format. Now, the fourth layer uh, is, I'm referring to as, as the e-reader layer. Now, as we currently see here, we've got five main uh, mainstream browsers, uh, and uh, they relate directly to the applications uh, and devices that are, that are out there. Now, it's it's a challenge to uh, test the accessibility of uh, five ma main browsers. It's a completely different story to do the same for well in excess of 200 applications and devices alike. Uh, the final layer is what I'm referring to as the, the e-content layer. And that simply uh, just refers to a, essentially a web page related directly to uh, the, the page of an e-book. Now, this might be where a person perhaps uh, with, with a disability might need to um, uh, uh, you know, work, work their way down through different you know, levels within the document. So they might go through uh, from, from uh, chapters down through to headings, may, maybe down through to, to paragraphs, uh, and then perhaps to, say, sentence level. They may even need to isolate uh, single characters now, I want to uh, bring, bring it to a close in terms of uh, how, how, how do these different layers uh, uh, integrate uh, or, or, or work with a device? And they integrate into this uh, accessibility evaluation framework. Now, this is actually based on a review of the literature. 
it was also uh, based on um, taking uh, two mainstream devices. So, for example, the uh, the Android platform and the, um, the the iPhone, and actually sitting down with the devices and going through it systematically and working out exactly what a user needs to do uh, in order to actually establish and understand these, these separate layers. Now, I just want to say that this is a work in progress and some of the, the terminology might change. So for example, I've referred to them as layers. Uh, it, it might be that I, I just w I might change it to, to components in, instead. Now, the, the other uh, thing just to point out here is that this uh, evaluation framework is currently focused on higher education. And the reason that this is the case is that uh, a user might need to um, uh, uh, search for a required academic e-text. So for example, they might, they might look for a, um, a journal paper. They might also look for a, a previous exam, an exam paper for, for revision purposes. And they'd use their device in conjunction with uh, user agents or the applications uh, and uh, or browsers on the mobile device. They'd, they'd use this uh, uh, to, to search for, through, through the discovery layer, um, to, to search for the required academic e-text that they need. Once they found it, they would then be given the option to, uh, to perhaps up, upload it to the cloud so they could use it across uh, many different devices. Um, now, just draw, drawing to a close, and so this is the sort of you know, take-home message, message, as it were, is, is to say that uh, navigation in this context is, is fundamental to, this, to accessibility, to this entire process. Um, but, but more specifically, that the, the exchange and that the, the use of information uh, between each of these, these different layers. So, so just here, um, you, you've got um, wh where the arrows are. If, if the exchange and use of information is impeded or prevented between any one of those layers, uh, then, then the accessibility is affected. So I'd just like to say uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to pr present my research to you today. It's been a, a real pleasure, and thank you for your attention. Great. Are there any questions for Neil? Okay, I have a quick question if that's okay. Um, so going back one slide, uh, there's, at least to me, it seems like there's a pretty big split between the discovery layer and then the layers that come after it, like the metadata, the e-content form format, the reader, and the content itself. Um, so do you think that the gap between those, between the discovery layer and then the four layers that follow is maybe more significant or there's bigger opportunities there for information to be lost or harder to access? Uh, yes, I, t I totally agree with you. I mean, that's, yeah. that's certainly something that we are, well, are beginning to, to at the moment. Um, I think in terms of drilling down into that is that we're looking at the potential of, of uh, uh, different categories. Uh, also, the, there's, there's the possibility of um, uh, looking at the accessibility requirements between each layer, and exactly that point is that you know, there's, there is a bit of a disconnect, and so we, we are exploring that. So, so thank you for the question. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you very much. And we'll have the other three participants this afternoon in the later session. Right, so I'm going to chair the second half of the doctoral consortium presentations, which is again three students presenting their work um, who were in the doctoral consortium. And there's five minutes per presentation or five minutes for question and answering. And we have scheduled 20 minutes for this. If anybody thinks there's a mathematical problem there, then you're probably right. <laughs> anyway, the first speaker today is, uh, is Julio Vega from the University of Manchester in the UK. And is going to talk about using web interactions to monitor Parkinson's disease through behavioral inferences on the web. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Julio Vega. Uh, this is a quick overview of my work that I've been doing for the past uh, year and a half back in Manchester. Uh, the very basic idea behind my work is to use behavioral inferences and smartphones to uh, measure the progression of the disease. Uh, a bit of context on the problem. So Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder. That means it's going to get worse no matter what. So patients can only use interventions and medication to try to uh, lessen the symptoms. 
the critical point with Parkinson's is that it has a wide variety of symptoms. So you can have tremor, which is probably the most uh, famous one, but you can also have gait issues, uh, slow movement, um, depression, apathy, and other functional problems. Um, and also it's very unlikely that you are gonna have two patients with the same, uh, same set of symptoms develop at the um, uh, same rate. So it's difficult to tailor medication to uh, each patient. Uh, taking into account um, previous um, works using wearables and smartphones, and also taking advantage of uh, their ubiquity, we came up with this approach, uh, which is um, use a smartphone log data plus external data sources to infer uh, proxies about uh, their activities or habits, and then link that to the progression of the disease. Uh, we have collected uh, for a pilot study of three months 27 different data sources. Uh, we are uh, including uh, two more for, for a new uh, year-long study, uh, which includes web and interaction data. Uh, this includes uh, use apps and websites, uh, touch interaction data, and also keyword types. And we are aiming to monitor patients uh, for, as I said, uh, a long period of time, and also without imposing any evaluation tasks or uh, asking them to use the phone in any particular way because uh, this is gonna be for, uh, for, many, for many months throughout their lives, then you start having um, adherent problems with, um, with approach. So, so far we have um, carried out um, a literature review and also laid out a methodology to, to complete this approach. And we can talk about the data analysis. Uh, so we have two tasks, proxy identification and profile of living generation. So for the first one, proxy identification, we have identified six uh, hypothetical proxies that we think uh, might link to the progression of the disease. So we have three important or that we consider are more promising ones, uh, which are typing patterns, phone usage pat uh, patterns, including uh, touch interactions, and also uh, going up uh, and down stairs episodes. And uh, once we have identified these proxies, then we want to measure how they fluctuate throughout time. To do that, we came up with a metric called profile of living, which uh, has two parts, uh, an individual baseline and then uh, fluctuations uh, measured over that baseline. To get into uh, a bit more of uh, detail with this. So this is only for illustrative purposes. We can have, uh, sorry, we can see a graph with uh, time in the x-axis uh, on a monthly basis from January to December. Then on the y-axis, we can have um, um, uh, um, a scale to measure uh, the different scores of the metrics that compose uh, each proxy. So for this example, we have three metrics for the typing patterns proxy. We have uh, typing speed, typing errors, and typing uh, holds. Uh, those are plotted in three uh, gray lines. Then we have in the red line a clinical score of, of Parkinson's disease that we are gonna use as ground truth um, and we are collecting um, uh, at uh, periodic points in time during the monitoring period. So from, uh, from the first uh, four uh, months, uh, we are gonna generate a baseline. It is, this is just an example. And then once we have a, an individual baseline uh, for each uh, participant, we are gonna measure fluctuations from that baseline. And once we have uh, the scores of these fluctuations, we can run a correlation analysis to see if we are measuring Parkinson's disease at the same uh, rates that the clinical scores. Um, future work includes uh, recruiting more participants for our study, um, also collecting more data during the following uh, 11 months, uh, finding and only focusing on one proxy because this is a very broad problem. So each proxy can have uh, very simple metrics, but also uh, very complicated ones. And uh, we also want to evaluate our proxy using um, uh, the clinical scares, uh, scales that uh, I already mentioned. This includes uh, cognitive scales, motor scales, activities of daily living scales, um, and so on. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, so one of the um, one of the um, um, characteristic characteristics of this work is to focus on a macro scale of behavior. So we don't want to look at a specific K traits um, uh, or very fine motor movements uh, because I am aware that can be very difficult and you can um, from noisy data without uh, controlling conditions that can be um, uh, difficult. So uh, instead of measuring uh, gates uh, um, details when going up or downstairs, we want to focus, for example, on episodes. So how often do you go up and down, or how long do you take, or uh, the time of the day that you are doing that. Uh, so give it give it a more of uh, context with uh, the whole data set that we have with the different data sources. Yeah, so it would be very interesting. We we considered it uh, from from for some time. So we considered Android Wear uh, watches or activity trackers uh, like uh, the Xiaomi band uh, because of time constraints, uh, budget constraints, and also because uh, we're trying to be the less intrusive uh, as possible with with uh, patient's body. Uh, probably we are going to have that out <laughs> just just for for this project. But I mean, um, I also forget to, to mention this. If you have any suggestions, ideas on the methodology, the proxies, uh, any issues that you think uh, we might uh, run into, I'm quite happy to discuss that later on. Zina. Yeah, but thank you for the question. I have one question. Um, yeah. are you, have you considered using a control group as well? Um, so only with patients? Yes, it's only with patients. So this is a bit different from um, uh, diagnosis. And um, so we are hoping because of the longitudinal um, approach, uh, we are trying to tailor that to the specific patients and those we can evaluate our inferences only uh, among patients and not with a control group. Well, that's, I hope that kind of makes sense. All right, well, thank yeah. you. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for nice for you, oh, which yeah. you can try. So our next um, award winner is um, Flynn Wolf from the University of Maryland, and he's going to talk about um, the developing a wearable tactile prototype to support situational awareness. So hello, uh, my name is Flynn Wolf. I'm working with Dr. Cooper uh, at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, my research has been supported by the NSF. Um, I'm working on assisted tactile cues, uh, which uh, obviously have um, helpful purposes with people with disability and also um, trying to help overcome situational impairments, so situations where uh, visual auditory channels are, are blocked or unavailable because of noise, or glare, or darkness, or something like that. Um, there's promise uh, uh, for using these cues with devices because the technology that supports them uh, can be quite small and low power, can be inconspicuous and quite durable. Um, and I'm also working uh, on continuing uh, projects that have been ongoing at UMBC in the HCC department, working with head-mounted devices. So the head is an interesting place. Um, it brings its own issues in sort of doing uh, tactile support, um, but it could be quite promising because um, for one thing, it supports all sorts of realistic, manual, hands-free tasks. Um, it also, uh, I should say, it, it might work in conjunction with uh, augmented reality and augmented vision hardware, which is just starting to sort of reach the market and, and catch people's interests. Uh, and it's sort of an under-researched area. So uh, what I'm interested in is, uh, can these tactile cues um, help with effective attention redirection uh, and allocation? So can People use these cues uh, per, and interpret them precisely and without getting frustrated. Uh, and if that is the case, uh, uh, how best can we do that? How can those uh, cues be formatted uh, so that people get the most out of them? Uh, how much is too much? Uh, that, um, how much can be presented, for instance, through a head-mounted device realistically? Um, 
And in the real world, how do things like distraction, exertion, uh, interact with these things? Are those uh, problems that have to be accounted for in terms of perception and comprehension? And uh, last and certainly not least, uh, what are the unique requirements uh, for using these uh, for assistive purposes? And what, I, what I'm hoping to produce ultimately uh, is contribute to guidelines. Obviously, there, we've talked about this. There are tactile guidelines for all sorts of things, um, but contribute uh, hopefully to the discussion on multi-parameter tactile cues. So uh, cues can come in uh, different types. Uh, you can vary things like pattern, amplitude, uh, frequency, and waveform. I'm particularly interested in pattern. Uh, I'm also interested in terms of uh, how research can be done on this subject in, in helping with further how things like participatory design can be used uh, with tactile. So everyone has these experiences constantly, but trying to find uh, common frames or references so that these uh, discussions can proceed. And also, um, since I'm interested in, in sort of the, the fine details of how these signals are used, um, being able to look at what is happening with interpretation in process. So uh, instead of just looking maybe simply at outcomes, uh, try to understand how they're being interpreted in real time. So to that end, uh, I've been looking at using um, situational awareness uh, assessment methods like SAGIT, which are designed for that purpose. Um, so I'd like to talk about three studies that I conducted along these lines. The first was an exploratory participatory design study I uh, started with uh, questionnaires and interviews to gather experiences that people have had with uh, situational impairment and derived from that uh, set of uh, seven use case scenarios, which I posed to focus groups. So try to get these people to think about real problems and how tactile cues could help. Um, I did try using a vocabulary exercise to uh, establish that kind of common frame of reference for language. So they uh, gave them real cues and asked them to describe them so that people could talk about these things in a consistent way. Uh, and they came up with uh, some interesting uh, tactile solutions and they, in true participatory design fashion, did have interesting and kind of surprising things to say. They talked about uh, keeping the designs fairly simple, um, the need for the form factor of the wearable to be something that they wouldn't get beat up for wearing, uh, inconspicuous and fashionable, um, and that there uh, might be some advantage in thinking about exertion. Uh, and things like that. So if I'm biking and I'm, my pulse is going in my temples, uh, does the mode of it need to account for that? Um, and additionally, um, if you're giving directional cues and the head is moving, how do you account for that in terms of the, the azimuth that you are trying to cue the person towards? Um, and they also gave a basic set of tactile designs uh, to respond to those use cases, which I used in the second study, um, where I presented those cues um, through a uh, head mounted device using um, just two tactors um, and working with waveform pattern in those two positions. Um, I also used a, a uh, distraction condition so to see how that would interact with people's ability to identify these cues accurately. So I gave them a, a whack a mole game uh, you know, to try to realistically uh, represent visual distraction and multitasking. So it's a game that they have to sort of look at and play at the same time uh, and use. Um, a NASA TLX measure to see cognitive loading, how frustrating it is to try to do all these things at the same time. And I uh, found some interesting results. There, there are, there's error at a fairly high rate in all of the work conditions, uh, but there were some interesting findings in terms of what types of signals seem to work better than others in terms of error rate and uh, cognitive workload. Um, and also these ideas of patterns. So uh, for instance, the focus group had talked about using increasing and decreasing patterns to represent uh, spatial hazards that might be coming or, or going away from the user. So sort of almost like a simulated echolocation kind of thing. Um, and people struggled with using those. Um, so I, I took those findings into a third study um, and presented people with a tactile storyline. So basically a set of cues presented again through a head-mounted device that represented a series of spatial hazards sort of coming and going and additional hazard coming and going from their proximity. Um, and I asked people to uh, describe what they were experiencing uh, in terms of uh, the SAGIT situational awareness method. So stopping them uh, at various points through the storyline and asking them um, what they're experiencing in terms of the situational, the standard situational awareness model. So what they were perceiving, comprehending, and predicting. So essentially, what did you just feel? Um, what do you think it means? And what do you think will happen next? 
Uh, and I also included some exertion conditions, so sitting, walking, and standing. Uh, and again, some interesting findings. I think there's more work to do in applying those methods. I'll hurry up. Uh, yeah, so I, I'd like to understand more about how those changing proximity pattern signals can work better. And also, um, again, I started with uh, use cases that drove tactile storylines that were based in um, uh, people without disabilities. That's who was available for those uh, initial set of findings. So I'd like to apply them to uh, specifically to assisted purposes. Uh, so my thanks again to my department and the uh, organizers. Time for a quick question. I did not bring a prototype with me, no. Sorry. Um, go right ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll just point to some photos. Simon, quick question. Sorry. His forehead there. Um, so my question is, um, does it matter particularly that you're directing feedback based on the location of the, of the kind of threat, I suppose, or whatever it is? Or is it more important to just 